July 25th, 2023, and we are in the discussion section, Basics of Active Inference. This is the first discussion section that we've had for this course, so thank you all for joining. And it's going to be regarding the topics that Ben White introduced in his recent lecture. So everyone will be welcome to pop in and introduce themselves. And then I know that Ben has some ideas to discuss and many other spontaneous and written questions will come into play. So I will, uh, with that, exit for now and pass to perhaps some of our first time live stream guests. Well, I guess I, I've already spoken, so uh, I may as well continue. So I'm Darius. Um, I am a master's student. I'm just about to finish at UCL in sort of social distributed cognition. I work in a social cognition lab looking at salience regulation and attentional mechanisms within social contexts, and but all within an active inference framework uh, within the Bayesian brain hypothesis framework. And yeah, it's a sort of recent discovery and obsession and so i'm sort of getting to grips with the, both the high road and the low road um and so i've had the opportunity to chat to mark and some other researchers who have been super informative but always looking to learn more and get my head around even more of the sort of philosophical and mathematical theory cool sounds good can jump in. hi everyone can you hear me yep I'm Francesco Balzan. I'm a, I'm a PhD student at the University of Bologna, Italy. Actually, working on an intersection between uh, artificial intelligence and education. Uh, I have a background in cognitive anthropology and philosophy of science, and I met Axel and Max a uh, few years ago. So I dived into the rabbit hole of the uh, energy principle and active inference, and currently pretty much interested in. Uh, um, multi-scale active inference models of uh, scientific cognition. So pretty interested about the agent level modeling of uh, scientific reasoning, assumption that might emerge from the interaction with the a scientific environment. So we're referring to scientific means construction and all these type of uh, uh, top-down and bottom-up interactions. So super interested to hear something from you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would anybody else like to introduce themselves before we start? Yeah, hi. So, so you go first. <laughs> okay. Hi. Hi, I'm Regina Sagin. Um, you can call me Gina. I'm from Guatemala. And, well, I'm not from the social sciences. I come from biology and neuroscience. And um, I'm here because um, I'm working on a project as a technical operator in this big project in the Exascape and Material Minds. And I do the technical part and experiments, but I want to learn the philosophical part. That's the background that, you know, makes the theory of everything we're going to, you know, experiment. So I'm here to learn. Um, and also I am like, you know, when you see the Olympics, that you you see all the swimmers and you always see i wish there was a normal guy to see how good these people are so you could compare so that's me today right i i understand half of what's going on but i'm happy to be here so yeah hi hi yeah uh, sorry i'm late um so my name's lee um i'm a phd student at the uh University of York, um, studying systems transformation, um, and I'm I, I'm joining because I'm using a uh, perceptual control theory at the minute to uh, to model examples of effective practice um, in organisations, and and I've read quite a lot of um, uh, active inference papers, and and I understand that there's a lot of resonance uh, and overlap between perceptual control theory and um, active inference although i understand it's within a predictive framework and also it's a it's a kind of a level of abstraction higher 
So you're able to kind of quantify the difference between uh, sort of the, the predictive state or the outcome state and, you know, and the, and the current state. So what I'm really trying to understand is how might that level of abstraction be useful um, in what I'm doing, actually, because I understand it's a, you know, a much more kind of concurrent theory and framework than, um, than perceptual control theory. Yeah, very cool. Um, anybody else? I think there's, is that everybody? Okay, well, um, was everybody um, present at the, has everybody seen the lecture that I gave uh, a couple of weeks ago? So, okay, so I, well, I think it might be helpful then if I kind of very, very briefly go over what what we covered in that lecture, just to kind of jog people's memories, and then we can maybe pick up some questions from there. Um, so the lecture last week was on the basics of active inference, and it was um, intended to be an introduction to the framework on a very abstract philosophical level. So it left out all of the kind of mathematics and technical aspects of the framework. And the objective really was to lay the groundwork for future weeks in this course, because um, this is obviously a course on active inference in the social sciences and so in the subsequent weeks we're going to be looking at topics like collective behavior social cognition uh shared norms and niche construction and so what i wanted to do was to put on the table um a, a kind of fully fleshed out picture of what the individual agent looks like in active inference and so to do this um we looked at uh emotion agency uh mind so we looked at kind of the role of action um and perception um the role of internal representations um in active inference and then as a case study we kind of uh, we looked at a active inference based account of addiction to kind of bring all of these threads together um to kind of articulate a lot of the things that that i'd said in the previous sections um so I'm, I mean, the questions here don't have to be specifically um, tethered to that lecture. I suppose we can just start with any general questions about active inference and, and philosophy and how active inference applies to individual agents. Or if anybody did want to pick up on any threads from the lecture, then we can go from there. Can, can I ask something just for the basic questions? Yeah, of course. Um, I don't understand because I think you explain it later, but how? How does creativity and science in general enters active inference? How does trying to be creative and not doing what you predict enters this like world? Yeah, yeah, this is a really good question, and I think um. So, were you there? Uh, have you did you see the lecture? Yeah, but I remember half of it. Yeah, no, that's yeah. That, that's fine. But uh, I think. Uh, I think, do you remember uh, the dark room problem? Yeah, yeah, I know that's yeah. that's where the answer is, but... Uh, if yeah, could... well, that's, it's, 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 I think there are several interesting uh, dark room problem, some of them more, some of them more interesting than others. And I, I tried to cover, I did obviously didn't have time to cover, cover all of those in the lecture. Um, but the kind of, for those that, perhaps aren't familiar, the dark room problem is um, this kind of canonical philosophical worry um, about predictive process and an active inference that says, essentially, if it's if all we're trying to do is minimize prediction errors, why don't we um, just find maximally predictable environments? And, you know, why do we not just lay in a dark room hooked up to an intravenous drip and enjoy a kind of error free lifestyle? Um, so th I think that's the kind of that's the question that you're articulating there. Um, I just quickly see a hand from Darius. Darius, did you want to jump in, or was it a separate question? It's a separate question. So uh, okay. I would just do it in advance, but yeah, yeah no, ignore me. I'll also call back around in a second. Then, but cool, everybody, yeah, yeah, no feel free. Um, I should say actually, um, this is the first time I've kind of chaired a discussion like this. Uh, so I'll be explicit and say um, people should just feel free to jump in whenever they want, if you want to take the disco, if you want to kind of um, add something or or kind of build on a question that we're answering, feel free to jump in. Um, but yeah, with the, with the dark room problem, the as, I, as I'm aware, the first answer to that question, and this is something that I did cover in the lecture, is 
essentially a big part of active inference is to recognize that the the agents are it's it's a kind of fundamentally embodied framework okay so what that it that can be kind of cashed out in various ways but one of the one of the most important ways is that the the expected states of the organism or that the agent are necessarily rooted in the phenotype of the organism and the, the kind of evolutionary biological needs that come with having a particular body. So there was a paper that I referenced in a lecture by, there's three authors on this paper. It's Andy Clark, Carl Friston, and then I'm forgetting the name of the third author. If anybody can recall, um, feel free to drop it in the chat. But this is this is an answer to the dark room where it builds on that notion of embodiment and says, look, um, Creatures like us, human agents, could sit in the dark room and do nothing and just uh, kind of enjoy the very predictable march of hunger, thirst, etc. But obviously those particular biological sets of the room. And so you have this very fundamental level. Um, we have this very fundamental um, kind of basis upon which we have these needs that need to be met. And so we need to engage in exploratory behaviors. Um, on the topic of novelty, um, because that's because that's a kind of base. I take that to be a kind of baseline answer. Um, but there are clearly um, kinds of activities and behaviors that we do engage in, um, going beyond the dark room. Kind of curiosity, play, um, creativity, engaging in kind of why do we create works of art? And it, there's not an obvious link between those kinds of behaviors and the kinds of biological needs um, that are emphasized in the original answer to the dark room worry. Um, so in answer to Regina's question about creativity, I think that a good starting point for this is the section on aerodynamics that I introduced in the lecture. So this was the idea that it there's this strong connection between affectivity as a kind of emotional embodied feeling state and the changes to the rate in prediction error minimization so i don't know um i am now very much uh articulating mark's work here so i don't know if mark wants to jump in at any point and do a much better job than i can um no, but I think, <laughs> yeah <laughs> I think there's there's certainly there's certainly work on the horizon. I know that there are people who are currently building up theories of artistic creativity that are that are based on this this idea of aerodynamics. Um, so Mark's paper on play with Mark Anderson that I mentioned has a really interesting idea where if you explain playful behaviors, which are kind of fundamentally creative and play we are you know it's an inherently creative exercise i think the really interesting idea that comes out of that is one thing that we engage in because it feels good is we we create niches of very manageable prediction error that we can then minimize <coughs> um so yeah that, that's playful behavior on uh, is a kind of the, the answer to the puzzle of play so why do we the puzzle of play is why do we engage in are metabolically quite costly um, and they don't have any obvious benefit and the idea there is that well there's there's kind of several ideas in there um, but one of them is that it just literally feels good because minimizing prediction error feels good to us so whenever we do better than expected at minimizing prediction error it feels good and so I think so I don't, obviously I don't know for sure, but I think that any answer that we give regarding artistic creativity is going to fall within that kind of bulk that essentially we engage um, in the part of the creative process is just constructing those that give us tasks that gives of manageable prediction error that ideally sit at the boundaries of our skill capability. Can I add two quick things there, Ben? So just, so that was yeah, a great but, explanation, yeah. but just to hit two points a little bit harder. One, you might think um, all that matters is being error. That's why it looked a little bit paradoxical that we also pre antithetical to our modus operandi, which is to reduce error. But when you remember that for our kind of prediction error minimizing system, we have a really deep temporal model. We're managing uncertainty at a, at a big horizon. 
uh, maybe even multi-generational, you know, where we're thinking about our kids or our kids. I mean, who knows how deep the generative model actually runs? It turns out that in that that stops developing error minimizing skills and abilities and just hangs out in one micro niche because that micro niche is going to be upset sooner or later, right? I mean, it's such a great example of where we thought we were in a really set vector state and then suddenly it gets jostled and all of us go, oh my goodness, like, what do we do? We've been bumped. Um, and uh, it turns out that the best error minimizer will be the sensitive to kinds of errors that are available and in hates those errors are digestible. So that means not too complex that you can't do anything with it, you can't learn anything from it, but also not so boring that there's nothing to learn. If we hang out, if we're sensitive to and we hang out at the edge of our capability, then we keep developing new error minimizing abilities, which actually sets us up to be good error minimizing systems over the long run. So even though we're investing metabolism now, we're getting we're setting ourselves up to be able to manage, you know, in especially in the deep end of the pool, black swans manage uncertainty that we're not going to be able to predict. They're really unpredictable, unpredictable. Um, that comes from hanging out at this edge. So part of our, our curiosity and playfulness and creativity are going to be about us making and digesting novel slopes of volatility. I think that's one, that's one really great answer for why you get playfulness and curiosity out of this and creativity. I'll just drop one more and we don't have to get into it too deeply here, but here, here's one other one that we're thinking of. There's something really special in the creation of art, especially in a public sphere, that I think is so interesting and that somebody needs to be sort of looking at this. Um, we, there's actually a new collection coming out in Philosophical Trans B um, on art and predictive processing, which I think you should check out if you're interested in these topics. Um, but the idea that we've been thinking about is there are ways that we can bring our generative model out and put it into a public sphere you can take something which is typically on the inside and you can put it outside. And then you can have other error minimizing systems look at it and fiddle around with it. And then we can re imbibe it. Um, I mean, we're doing this all the time. I mean, that's what language allows us to do and what writing allows us to do. Think about maths. You're bringing a part of your predictive um, understanding, you're, you're laying it out, and then other predictive agents can fiddle around with it. And then you can take it back in as part of your updating your own model. And I, I don't know how much more I can say here. I just think this, this is a kind of horizon, but I think there's a really juicy thing to say here about where real art is like Tolstoy, maybe Leo Tolstoy was already on this, where you put something of the creator in the creation and then other people receive that and then they can, they can, um, they can do something else with it and then you're able to sort of take it back in all under the guise of sort of minimizing volatility or understanding volatility. Maybe that was a bit deep, but uh, no, that was really that okay. was really good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, I just in so in the chat, I just dropped a link to um, um, yeah. So somebody just asked about papers related to hanging out yeah. at the edge of our I'll, capabilities. And I'll do that right sure now. Are, yeah, there sure are some papers on that. Uh, Mark's got a few. I already dropped a link in there to an Aon article by um some of the old expect project crew, including Mark, Kate Nave, George Dean and Andy Clark on the value of uncertainty, which is, I think it's a really good start point for some of these questions. Um, just because it's, Aon is a kind of non-academic um, place where you can, you, you know, it's a, it's a non-technical introduction. And there's a wonderful example in that paper of a guy named, uh, I think it's Max Hawkins. Is that right, Mark? Max? who um, he's a kind of tech guy and he realized he was getting kind of bored with his life. He he inadvertently trapped himself in a dark room because his life had become so rote and scheduled and systematic. He realized that he would be kind of incredibly easy to kidnap because he was in the same place at the same time every single day. And to get, he took drastic action to break out of that dark room. So he, he, he kind of introduced a, a randomization algorithm that would it would kind of choose for him where he was going to eat where he was going to go which shows he was going to attend and this example is a really nice centerpiece in this article so and and i think yeah i think this is a nice place to start because it's also grounded in discussions about epistemic actions as well because there's also 
you know, as, as cool as play and art and creativity are, there's also really, really good reasons that uncertainty is valuable as well, right? Because while we might want to exploit all of the opportunities for kind of nourishment and valuable prediction error minimization in our environment, there are, of course, going to be times where um, those uh, those opportunities are exhausted and we need to go and explore different ones. And I think there's some there's it, there's some stuff in there as well on epistemic actions within the context of navigation as well. So sometimes we're going to have to uh, we're going to have to temporarily move further away from our target in order to minimize our uncertainty about where we're going. So there's lots and lots of of stuff on the value of uncertainty, um, and it kind of is very much at the forefront of some of the really interesting philosophical applications of the framework for sure. Um, okay. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. just, no, just, by all means, yeah, we've got time. Yeah, Go you just said something. I know you have a question that is, but with the value of uncertainty, it's just that I'm thinking, because I've been working a lot with the magicians, and there's a way of using uncertainty as entertainment. And it's very difficult to understand as a you know, as a concept for entertainment. Why would you like to be in a place where you cannot you want to predict, but you cannot and you still want to participate in this activity so for me magic shows it's kind of breaking a little bit um yeah i think magic, I, th I spoke to um i forget the person's name but there was a xscape meeting here at sussex and i spoke to one of the guys on xscape who had been working on magic um i don't know if you know who i'm talking about but i think they have a book on on magic um and I think that's really cool to think about from a predictive processing perspective, the idea that magic is just these wonderful kind of violations of expectations in a certain sense. I think predictive processing provides a nice, really intuitive framework for thinking about those kinds of things. One one little point there, uh, Regina, just about, again, if it feels paradoxical, just to sort of um, complexify your view, um, remember that the this is always happening in a hierarchical system. So just because you have errors at one level of the system doesn't mean you're going to have sort of critical, cascading, unbearable errors at higher levels. So that's why it's fun to go to horror movies. So I dropped the paper here. Also, we have a new paper coming out on, on horror movies. I'm pretty interested in this. Um, but it, it's, the same as the, it's the same as going to the magic show in some way. Now, the reason why um, those errors are, are fun is because we're safe in a theater. Um, we're with our friends. We have lots of sugar in our system from eating popcorn and candy. Um, we can control the amount of scary by, by um, you know, covering our eyes or like there's lots of control here. And yet we're, we're getting media that is that's pinging all of our evolutionarily ancient error tracking systems so that we're getting jumps in the physiology as if there's a bunch of volatility that we need to manage. And yet we're in a completely safe space which is really fun for our kind of system because we're hierarchically deep predictive systems. The high level here isn't jeopardized. It, it knows I'm in a theater, but the low level stuff is still registering all sorts of little volatilities, but of course they get squashed. They, they don't cascade all the way up. Um, or, or if you're the kind of person where they do tend to cascade all, all the way up, then you're also the kind of person who doesn't like going to horror movies because it kind of really scares like you go home and think, oh goodness, maybe ghosts are real and maybe I live with them. You wouldn't be going there then. So with magic, it's the same sort of thing. Um, we know to a certain degree. And so it, it, with errors alone, I don't know if you've ever seen, um, I can't remember who is, um, who does the really extreme magic. Yeah, David Blaine. Um, where he like was in a block. Yeah, David Blaine. Have you ever seen him? He goes to Haiti where you have a community that really believes in magic and he does some magic and he gets into trouble. Like suddenly all the young men are like, oh, no, 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 that's, that's no bueno that, that you're doing this. And then he had to, he, the camera pans back and he goes, no, 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 hold on. I'll show you here. I'll show you how it's done. It was just a trick. I'll, I'll just show you how it's done. It's not real magic because there, they're not having fun with it anymore. They're like, no, that's like not a good thing to do. Yeah. So it just goes to show that like, um, our, our engagement with magic uh, is mostly a, a sort of scary play. I think one thing I just kind of sorry about the seagulls. I don't know if you can hear those. There are uh, seagulls going crazy just outside my window. Um, <laughs> one thing I would add is I think um, another aspect to this this part of the framework, 
wherein you have this value of prediction error kind of epistemic and affective emotional value of predi prediction error it's one of the kind of key elements in this notion of uh agency get in active inference that i think is really it's going to be really important to in mind as you go through the further weeks of this course as well so what uh, you know like i said in the lecture it's not necessarily speaking to a quite the metaphysical question of free will but it's certainly moving us away from this picture of of, of the agent as a kind of automaton that's just following rules there's real space here for a kind of individuality and creativity as well okay darius has been waiting uh, a little while so um let's go over to him Happily patient, happily patient. Um, yeah, I mean, this is this question, I guess, is deriving from my thoughts about the meeting of the the high road and the low road. Some of the okay. recent work that's been coming out on Maxwell Ramsey and actually a conversation I had with him, which is that the generative model of the state's entire. So my question, given that, given and tall. Is regarding the notion of affordances. I think it's natural that as cognitive scientists and philosophers, we take the perspective intuitively of the agent in the agent arena relationship and how the agent is in the business of reducing prediction error. I was just wondering whether, as philosophers, um, you and Mark have thought about what it would what what is it like out for the whole system to be in the business of reducing its uh, prediction error. So I'm interested in flow states. Um, and so, for example, my thinking is, is that in the canonical example of a flow state, let's say a rock climber, the, the climbing wall is also in the business of reducing its prediction error as to afford the opportunity for it to be exploited. Self or themselves are in the business of reducing uh, prediction error. So I'm wondering whether this expansion of affordances is bi-directional, tri-directional, infinitely directional, embedded in That's an amazing question. So um, you, uh, I you mentioned Axel Constant, but is that somebody else? Uh, someone else. But I spoke to Maxwell Ramsteed oh. last week. Um, and yeah. He, yeah, yeah. But there's a there's a paper on. Uh, I'll find it in a second on uh, niche construction um, and um, affordances. I think it's. Axel Comte where they talk about the kind of mo the the symmetry between uh, a niche and an agent, um, very much in the, like the same vein as you were just talking about there. This idea that it's not just uh, it, there's not just this unidirectional kind of fit between the agent and the environment, but the or the niche is actually modeling generative model of the agent as well implicitly. Um, so I think the best I can do there direction of some really interesting work on that, but it's um certainly it's not it's it's an, it's not something that plays a central role in my thinking recently. Um yeah, so we have the participants in the Zoom chat. Yeah. A variation approach to niche construction. Yeah, I don't know if uh if Mark has anything to add or um, anybody else um which worth thinking about, yeah. Darius, can I just check one thing you asked? I, I don't know how much I need to add here, but um, did you think that the wall was mm. reducing free energy relative to the climber? Did you say that? That's right. So my, so I don't, I don't know how that can that be the case. Can that be the case? The wall, the wall as a thing, is yeah. maintaining itself, and I mean relative rain self evidencing, and, right? Yeah, but. But it's not really a duet of one here. It's not like it has a generative model that's deep where it's modeling the climber, modeling it like the same way as tango dancers do. A tango, the a, a tango duo are 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 having cooperative flow states because each movement opens a vista of possible error minimizing opportunities for the partner, who in turn opens a, a vista of error minimizing opportunities for the partner. Yeah, and backwards and forwards into this ever opening expanse of affordance capabilities but an inanimate object and an agent don't really have that same dynamic so i was wondering what you were thinking there so my thinking was is that this kind of bleeds into the notion of fluidity of affordances in the kind of gibsonian sense and the fluidity of concepts so i agree in this in the sense of physical self-evidencing 
it needs to model the rain, it needs to model the physical environment so as to maintain itself. But what about as it's a foot, it's a it's the so a sheer rock face is not a climbing wall and that's because it doesn't self-evidence as a climbing wall it doesn't offer the affordances to be climbed that's why i was kind of referring to which is that affordances change based on the on the age and arena relationship right your car's affordances change whether it's working or broken down similarly the climbing will change whether it's got footholds handholds or whether it's just a sheer yeah. rock face that was my thinking it seems slightly spook it seems slightly spooky to me that we'd think of the wall as self-evidencing in that way. I think I think mm. the language that we tend to use, because Julian Kivestein, Eric Reitfeld, um, Yale Brunberg, and folks often use the idea of affordances and fields of affordances in the active inference way. Um, the, the, the radical end of the pool there is typically that the affordances don't only happen on the agent side, but rather happen from a dynamic of the changing volatile environment and the generative model of the agent, and that they're they're collaborating in dynamic, ongoing ways, such that the affordances are emergent between them. That certainly, that certainly seems right to me. The the idea to push it a little bit further and think about the wall self evidencing, it's a it's a, it, I think it's a step too spooky for me. Um, I think I would I would feel safer safer a little bit closer to thinking about yeah the affordances are changing relative to the dynamics of the wall, um, but I don't know what it would mean for the wall to be evidencing the climber or itself ben, did yeah you add there? Uh, just to kind of that's stirred a couple of thoughts a little longer on um the work by affordances because there's this really nice distinction in their work between uh what they call well i'm not, I'm not sure if they i think i think the, the term landscape of affordances is a little bit older but they make this distinction between a landscape of affordances and a field of affordances and i think the reason this is it's, it's really important to get on the table is because it th this distinction is kind of directly targeting the dynamic shifting very affective nature of affordances so on the one hand you have this landscape of affordances that is relatively static so so right now my landscape of affordances is is brighton um and that's the landscape of affordances in that sense is not really going to change very rapidly unless i kind of jump on a plane and go somewhere else but the field of affordances has this thoroughly kind of normative affective character to it so depending on my internal state at any given time depending on my expectations or my desires say um, my field of affordances is going to shift very very rapidly and it's so not just not just predicated on my internal state but also kind of contextual cues as well so if something were to happen in the environment that was afforded very high precision weighting then that's likely to shift my field of affordances significantly um i think that the reason that i'm kind of emphasizing this to darius's point is and and kind of building on what mark said it it doesn't seem like this distinction at least would apply from the perspective of the perspective of the wall say because this kind of affectivity and normativity just isn't a feature of the wall's experience of the world and also to kind of run with that the i mean affordances but perhaps you could say a bit more about how you would kind of think about this darius because affordances are kind of opportunities for actions okay so it's they're they're kind of uh uh, I, I like to th there's some debate about this but I like to think of them as like a relational property between of like this you have the skilled capabilities of an embodied agent and then you have some feature of the environment so I think when you're thinking in from the perspective of the wall you have the features of the environment because you have the embodied characteristics of the agent are kind of playing that role but it's not clear to me what the the kind of skilled capabilities of the wall is it so yeah if you could just say a bit more about that yeah I mean it may be the case, as you pointed out, that actually the, the, the technical term affordance as being opportunities for action is misplaced here. Okay. So I can see, I, I, again, this is a lot of this I've been formulating having read this very new paper by um, Ramsey and colleagues on Bayesian mechanics of physics of and by beliefs, where he really rams home this point that the system, the generative model is the system of the kind of statistic, uh, stochastic differential equations across the state space. So across the Markov blanket, across the particle with its Markov blanket and the external states. And that is the system which is in, that system itself is in the business 
of reducing free energy. So it's not just the active inference right, agent; right. Yeah. it's the whole system, yeah. Yeah, which yeah. is embedded in a whole system of other things. And so that was my general thinking: is that for yeah. just on the prerequisite that these systems exist, just on that a priori axiom, there has to be some kind of self-evidencing of that system itself. So maybe affordances yeah. is the wrong word. I, yeah, I think, I think probably. I think that, yeah, that I, that might be the trick right there. As soon as yeah. you provoke affordance, yeah. you're provoking phenomenology, and so now we're not talking just about statistical variations. Now we're talking about lived experience. That might be that might be the the linchpin right there. I think. I think Ooh, that is right. Yeah, and I and I would say I think Darius, you're absolutely on the right track, and you're in. Uh, I mean, uh, the, there is this ambiguity about affordances, but aside from that, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it's. I, it's just nonsensical to think about an agent absent an environment under active inference. You have to, it, it, it is this agent environment system in its totality that's minimizing free energy. They have to be, they have to be taken together as one. And I know, Avel, you've had your hand up for a, for a little while there. Do you want to, is there something you wanted to add? Yep. Uh, do you hear me well? We do. I do, anyway. Okay. So um, about the affordances, world having affordances, and um, basically the symmetry of agent and environment is a property of active inference, well, of the free energy principle. So if you buy uh, the free energy principle, and you also buy that it entails that agent have affordances or any uh, proximal notion, then you, you also buy that walls have uh, affordances. So there are basically three positions you can have on that. Uh, one is that active inference is correct. We all have fucking affordances and they do self evidencing, which I would not go with. Another uh, option is that you have um, basically um, devolve in the details. So, for example, maybe the adjunct environment is not the wall, it's something that is broader, like Gaia system, whatever, and it just so happens it includes the wall, but it is not the wall and it does do self evidencing and the third is that active inference is wrong uh, we don't have affordances based on whatever is the uh, formal presentation of uh, active inference and i would go in that direction of this uh, phenology phenomenology stuff so we have a I would say philosophical evidence in, in the sense that they are denying this would lead to nonsense, but uh, information is based on observation and some system do observing much more actively than others. And maybe it's a good thing to have in your formalism, I'd say. Uh, so um, you, you have maybe a stronger case for uh, the way uh, phenomenology of are constructed in the quantum formulation of the FEP. If there is uh, such a thing, which uh, like Chris Fields, uh, someone who we should baseline believe claims there is, because then you have uh, formalization, which is not in terms of dynamics per se, so causal constraints, but observation and indirectly phenomenology. Maybe you have something that is stronger there, but uh, right now the uh, link, oh, and yeah, sorry, there is uh, actually a bunch of people who have a quite good hold on science, which are the based on the in ecological activity and cognition on one hand, and between cognition and the uh, metabolism, the constitution of the living thing that cognites on the other. And one of their, their definition of agency cognition, pick one, entails um, Interactional asymmetry, I think, is the word. That may be something we would need to translate into active inference, well, into the FEP, for active inference to have a strong grip over this affordance thing. Until then, we have a kind of hand-waving uh, way it relates it to more conceptual approaches uh, that are related to an active and ecological approach to psychology. And um, yeah, the formalism lags basically behind the uh, concept for now. Sorry for the long talk. No, that was great. Much appreciated. Does um, anybody else want to come in on uh, 
question of affordances? Because I know um, affordances played a fairly substantial role in the lecture. So, uh, so anybody has any questions related to affordances or you know action perception and affordances? Then now's the time. Yeah, I do have one, but it's not well structured yet. So that, that should be fine. Go ahead. Go ahead. It's something that we have been thinking about for the last months because I I started to deep in the artificial intelligence field, coming from a humanities background and philosophical background. So I'm mixing many things in in this period, mainly following the the active inference as a as a crosser between the many disciplines. That and this is very beautiful about the framework. And I was super curious about the um, the question proposed by Darius, and I was then thinking about. Now we're actually facing a a new environment and a, a new landscape in which we're like interacting with the uh, in actually generating over revolutionary time and synchronizing over revolutionary logical alien agencies operating within our landscape and field of affordances. Um so I think there's um a lot of really interesting work to potentially be done there i will take the opportunity to shamelessly plug um, a preprint that mark and i have released recently where um we one thing so one thing that i'm really interested in that i can kind of speak with some confidence on is the fact that i i do think there's a point at which the theory of affordances or the language of affordances starts to break down so the preprint that I'll share around is looking at amb um, ambient technology specifically. So this is technology that you the, the whole kind of impetus behind its design and conceptualization is that the user doesn't have to actually do anything. So it, it precedes the user pragmatically and epistemically. It knows what kinds of things you want it to do, and it just does them in the background. And it works by shifting Kind of it, it it subtly shifts the material environment such that it impacts your field of affordances in real time and uh, and and the argument that we make in that paper is essentially that the affordances approach doesn't really work for this and that we need to kind of think again so um yeah i mean i i think that that might be a nice but uh, like how to conceptualize generative ai for example under the affordances framework i'm not sure I, I don't know of anybody that's done any work on that but it would be it would certainly make a really cool project you are making it then right now <laughs> what's that you are making it right now i know because you sent me the paper to review oh yeah <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah, you. So, um, we were looking at we. So we are in early stages of a a paper on the role of um, generative AI in classrooms. Um, so from the perspective of thinking about what kinds of affordances generative AI represent in a in a learning environment. Um, particularly, we're we're kind of applying active inference to classroom design and looking at it from the different ang different uh, the angles of different um, educational and pedagogical theories. Um, but it's um, very early days. But that's yeah. This is I suppose it partly depends on your view of of uh, generative AI in general. I mean, it depends whether you would consider it uh, a real cognitive agent or not. I think I think some people are more inclined to think of it as you know this thing. This is a thing that has agency. It has real understanding. It has like um, you know, and, and other people are maybe less inclined to think of it in those terms. And I think that might be. That might bear significantly on on how you think of it. Yeah, that's super cool. That basically the last project you mentioned is very very in line with uh, my PhD project right now because my main PhD project is our European findings and it's about the AI for personalized education and I'm trying to follow it through the the active inference framework from a multi level perspective. So yeah, very cool. Yeah, we should we should probably talk more about that. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, Darius. Yeah, I wanted to ask, I mean, this may be directed more at Mark, because I know this is kind of his work, in terms of um, slopes of uncertainty and 
about doing better than expected at reducing prediction error over time. I was wondering kind of how the architecture of that is built into the into the particle, into the into the generative model, because we have the kind of it, for me, there's I don't know if it's an hour and out sort of conflict, but we have these kind of implicit priors that we're going to fulfill certain expectations or minimize prediction error regarding certain things. Right. So homeostatic priors or happiness, well-being, whatever it is. But then your claim is that we have the higher order beliefs, the higher order predictions that over and above that, I also need to become, I also need to do well, better than expected at reducing prediction error over time. So is there, I, I, it's still quite fuzzy in my mind, but is there a kind of potential conflict there between the general priors that the system has and then go actually, in a sense, violating those expectations by going over and above them? which itself constitutes an expectation. How do you kind of resolve that tension? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, but this is very much in Ben's wheelhouse too. Um, ben and I have been working on slopey stuff for uh, almost as long as I've been doing. Um, yeah. Um, on, um, uh, ben, effective charge. What was his original paper called? We'll get it, we'll get it up. They do a really good job of showing technically where this sits within um, a deep parametric model. Um, Lara Senved Smith's paper on metacognition also does this by showing you have these you have these depths of modeling where models above are modeling models below, okay, and optimizing over those models below. So we have some good computational backbone for thinking, um, for not only thinking that this is the case, but beginning to express how it does the work it does. Um, so let's let's leave that for digging into it though, technically on sort of on our own. Let me say sort of at a at a higher, more abstract level. Still, hopefully, it's useful. Um, it's not weird to think that this kind of anticipatory system is not only making predictions about the world, but it's also um, part of what it's predicting is how fast or slow, how efficient it is in particular contexts at resolving certain kinds of errors. That, that's a perfectly fine thing to think that we're also predicting slopes of engagement. And then, and then all we're saying then is the system also pays attention to when those expectations are breached and it's learning from those breaches that's that should just be the bread and butter for what the system does anyway so precision is a second order is a second order process in much the same way precision is about how well uh, how how reliable are lower level predictions um and then using that um that amount to toggle how impactful either errors or predictions are so we've already got baked into the system right from early days, this idea that the system's not only making predictions, but monitoring its own predictive processing regimes, and then toggling uh, based on how reliable those, those substreams are. Um, all we're adding here is, um, you know, when we, first, when we first thought about those mechanisms, one thing that can happen, this is just good for everybody who's interested in active inference, because I, I bump into this with my students all the time. When we say something like precision weighting, um, a tendency to think it's a thing. So we go to, to find this precision weighting, like where's the biological instinct or, or like this precision weighting. But when we actually get into a biosystem and we look for these things, the truth is precision is going to be weighted in lots of different ways. I mean, that's the real frontier of this research is to actually find how these things are instantiated. And the answer is going to be multifarious. I mean, it's going to be you're going to have precision adjustments happening throughout the system in lots of ways. It could be synchrony and asynchronies and desynchronies between systems. It can be neuromodulatory chemicals. It can be structural structural um, uh, shapes within the brain. I mean, um, precision is going to be set in, in lots of different ways. So um, uh, all, all that we're pointing out here is, is that it, one of the ways that precision is being set, one of the ways that the system is tracking how efficient it is and then upping or lowering the amount of impact um, error signals or predictions have is that it's happening in an embodied way. So we've looked over to the affective 
search. And and lo and behold, there are all these signatures that we were looking for for this kind of for this part of the machinery. So um, yeah, so not weird that the system is tracking its own regularities and adjusting. That was baked in right from the beginning. How it does that, that's one of the frontiers. It's going to happen in lots of different ways. Lo and behold, affective dynamics, the shoe fits. They look like they do that stuff. And then you bring it to the lab and you go back to like reward prediction error research. And sure enough, neuromodulatory chemicals, reward systems are tuning affective dynamics relative to better than and worse than slopes of uncertainty management. It's exactly what we would expect given the computational model. Um, so then it's an easy, it, it was an easy next step to start saying, well, look, there's one of the ways that precision is that there's one of the ways that affect the system. Now just notice there. It's the only decision is that, and not the only thing the affective system is doing. We never want to say, we never sort of, we're careful not to be reductionist to say, oh, affect is always aerodynamics. I don't think that's right. I think it's that aerodynamics are expressed in part affectively, and they have this impact on the system um, that we can, that, we, that we've known about for a long time, even from just the reward prediction error um, literature. Does that help? Or was that a bit, is that okay? Yeah. 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 Uh... yeah. Uh, Thank just you. to just to add two two things really quickly there, um, because I know time is kind of catching up with us. Uh, I would emphasize as well, like just as a kind of general point, the one of the things I really like about the work on aerodynamics and affect is it has this nice kind of broad capture of the kinds of affectivity that agents can experience. So we're not just when we talk about affectivity, we're not just talking about full-blooded emotions or even just moods, but um we're talking about what is it one of the things i kind of drew attention to in the lecture was matthew ratcliffe's work on existential feelings which i think is just such a um that the connection between active inference and phenomenology that you find in some of this work is just insanely powerful and it's one of the things that really drew me into the framework um the second thing just building um one thing that I don't think I mentioned in the lecture is uh, active inference. Has, it has been described as a, a quintessentially metacognitive framework. So you have kind of built into the architecture, you have expectations over expected. So you have kind of predictions about predictions. And this has proved to be um, just, you know, again, just phenomenally useful for thinking about certain aspects of phenomenology as well. So, um, yeah, I think that these are these are like real strengths of the framework. Okay. Um, I don't know how we're doing for time. Are we are we strictly limited on, or can we? We are not, as far as I know. Daniel. <laughs> well, um, I can probably do. I definitely do another fifteen. Um, if anybody has any more questions, and people, I should say as well, we're not. That doesn't mean that we're all held captive. Um, to my time frame. So if people if people do need to leave within the next five or ten minutes, that's absolutely fine. But um, I'm certainly happy to to carry on if anybody has any more questions or comments. Um, if if no one else has got any, uh, I would quite like to go back to uh, earlier in the discussion. You were talking about uh, the value of uncertainty, um, because uh, in organisations in, in, in which I'm working with. Uh, we often have conversations about uncertainty and what, what we find is uh, over time there tends to be a drift towards risk aversion so we're working with a, a large uh, international construction company at the minute and they used to have a culture in which innovation um, uh, was uh, was quite well embedded and and over time it's kind of drifted towards very very risk averse culture where actually rather than learning through the process and being able to tolerate uncertainty uh, you know around opportunities and you know what can be accomplished and that kind of the valence that comes with uh, the intrinsic reward i suppose of being able to reduce uncertainty about capabilities to a situation where they're trying to anticipate all of the risks up front before they even get involved in the project so you know there's there's some kind of valence switch market and you you mentioned um david blaine earlier you know and 
something about the context you know there was a switch in, in valence from yeah this is a, this is a kind of a play this is a safe thing to do to actually no this is you know this has real consequences so I, i'm just kind of i'd like to explore that a little bit more actually if, if anyone's got kind of any insights or papers or comments yeah so i, th I think that's a really interesting question actually and i i think um so it seems like one of the things one of the things we've been talking about is this connection between uncertainty prediction error minimization and affectivity in individual agents and it sounds like what you're asking is like how does that translate to uh like collectives so yeah. one of the things about active inference that we're going to see in subsequent weeks is how it scales up to kind of larger systems like companies or you know uh, groups that are trying to achieve some kind of shared goal um how do you how does the value of uncertainty translate onto like how is it scalable in that sense right is that would that be a fair kind of yeah i i guess so um i i guess it's um i, I mean uh so uncertainty often when it's talked about uncertainty is talked about as risk which is, you know, I suppose is, you know, predictions or anticipation of uh, outcomes that we don't want, right? Whereas yeah. there, there's also positive uncertainty, right? You know, which is, you know, I suppose, op you know, simply stated opportunities, you know, through curiosity, you know, what might we be able to achieve, you know, this kind of novelty seeking, I guess, that, you know, new opportunities that we haven't exploited. Um, and they're just, you know, uh, in the kind of organizational systems, uh, you know, I, I think there are various pressures that cause it, but but over time, you you see these cultural shifts towards uh, you know a, a very very kind of risk averse, you know where you know where the valence is obviously quite negative, you know you know quite an unpleasant feeling for people, and I, yeah, yeah, I'm just yeah, kind this of is, yeah, this yeah. is good. This this is right at the heart of my current work. Um, yeah. I'm really interested. So you know, we just had a big stint where active inference models were starting to be used in computational psychiatry, especially for pathological disorders. So addiction, depression, disassociative disorders, OCD, PTSD. Um, it's a really, it's quite a, it's a quite um, a, a sexy framework for thinking about some of the ways that the cognitive system breaks down. And the sort of new move right now, I mean, we have a collection coming out right now in neuroscience of consciousness, is to think about these things in terms of, okay, if we are predictive systems and we have a sufficiently rich model of how that system works in a particular niche, what sorts of what sorts of um, what sorts of ways can we intervene on that system in order to have positive outcomes rather than just modeling what the negative outcomes are? And mm -hmm. I hear that a lot in what you're saying now. So I'm just going to drop one link for you there. This is Casper Hesp again. Um, wrote a little, a very small paper with a nice little model called Sophisticated Affective Inference. He has a little bot that tends towards catastrophe, catastrophizing the future. If it's right. given, if it's given like fun, medium fun, medium fun, dangerous over time, uh, it tends to, it tends to expect the dangerous one. Um, uh, like after 10,000 iterations, it basically lives in the worst possible scenario, which is a nice little this, thought. This is my wife. I'm, right. I'm going to give <laughs> well, this is, this is most people today, you know? So the question is, um, uh, I want to know, given the model, why does that happen, and what can we be doing to intervene? And um, part of the answer is going to be um, we need to become more tolerant of uncertainty. That's one of the things that the system can be better or worse at. So this just takes the computational modeling and then looks to things that we already know about emotional regulation. That that's that's part of the story. Um, so. Um, We've done a little bit of work on this with our um, predictive dynamics of happiness and well-being, and Ryan Smith is definitely doing work on this with active inference and well-being. Um, so definitely check that out if you're if you're interested here. Um, but, uh, I just flag one interesting thing here that relates just to what we were just talking about about layers of modeling. One way that a let's say two ways. There's two ways that a system, and it's probably going to be lots, but the two that come to mind that a system can become more tolerant uncertainty is one exposure. So this is why exposure therapy might be useful for our kind of a system. You want to expose the system to volatility at the lower and middle levels of the hierarchy and have it turn out okay. So that this one of the things that the system can come to predict is, is not only, you know, 
particular outcomes, but it can also predict how much error is involved in particular outcomes. So for instance, um, when I used to give um, a pro talk, I was always really nervous. Um, and I don't know if that ever really went away, but I've had so much exposure to the anxiety of giving a professional talk that basically I don't notice it anymore. But if you were to ask me at the beginning of my talk, Mark, right now, what's your phenomenology? And I sort of meditatively looked, I'd probably say, yeah, I'm nervous. But if you hadn't have said that and you were just like, hey, what's up? I'd have been like, oh yeah, I'm great. Like it, it's all good. I don't even notice it anymore. That's because the system knows that I have errors go up, but as soon as I start talking, they drop away. And because I know the arc, that even error in the system, it becomes non-newsworthy. It's no longer interesting volatility to be tracking. That's just mm. from exposure. Okay, so what's happening is you're having errors at a lower or middle level that a higher level is now modeling, saying when yeah. we come here, we should expect this arc of error. Same thing when you work out. Like real gym rats, they can feel good. You're having your jet, your skeletal system, right? But at the higher level, it's now learned not only that that has a natural arc, but that that's a good sign at a higher level. So now you're getting a positive, you're getting positive prediction error slope high and negative prediction error slope low. Okay. So one yeah. is exposure. Two, you can model your own responses. This is something Ben and I work on with um, horror movies. Um, uh, you can you can you can take an active role in mindfully observing your own reactions to volatility. And um, this comes up in our paper on horror. We've already dropped the link today if you want to check it out. Something right. really special happens when the system models its own reaction to volatility. It starts to learn that um, even reactions to volatility. Uh, don't need to be um they don't need to be compounded up into dangers that it's okay it's okay to be uncertain at certain levels of the system so how that translates in the business i'm not sure other than i know tolerance to uncertainty is a marker of business success and um i suspect the framework in a fit like lots of mindfulness mindfulness work about learning to tolerate uncertainty is there anything about um, the role of, of language in kind of modulating those metacognitive? Oh, it's good. If I may, I was uh, preparing an answer on that specifically, and I was nervously waiting for the opportunity. Uh, so, yeah. Sorry, Mark. So, um, like meta, in terms of evolutionary um, cognitive archaeology, we don't know when language emerged, but we do know that. Uh, let's say an anchoring semantic system. So you can build things in language and you can expect things in the world to correspond to things in language. So for example, if you, that's abstract, as I say, it's, it's abstract, but you can, for example, have a self-identity and oh, I'm, a, I'm a French, I'm a French. And I communicate with the expectation that are uh, embedded in that identity with other people. And that means we communicate over norms. So, so we have specific expectation of what we will do and those expectations, they become embedded in specific symbolic markers that are embedded in language. And uh, something that, uh, like, like the thing that it was strongly evoked in my mind when you talked of uh, tolerance to uncertainty is that um, as far as documented history goes, uh, Europeans, well, Indo-Europeans, they are pretty strong on the idea that uh, things have a nature and they act lawfully and their nature and their laws, they somehow correspond to linguistic categories. So I can say stuff like um, chickens quack and that's a proper explanation of what are chicken and why they quack. And if you look in uh, Chinese philosophy, as far as uh, written history goes, you have a much better accent on uh, way wu way. So um, a poor translation would be uh, effortless action, or a uh, closer translation would be uh, action without action. So it's a form, it's something that is quite close to the phenomenology of flow, in that you observe yourself doing things and you do not apply a conscious effort to uh, the flow of what you're doing. And that looks like something that is uh, closer to the phenomenology you'd expect if you apply, you know, recursive predictive cognition, 
with less or less heavy or more effective integrated um, symbolic anchoring, like use of language as something that you actually expect to be meaningful and to uh, constrain strongly your actions. And marginally, I'd expect very strongly to expect that linguistic categories will map and what you build with it, so I don't know, self-identities, plans, whatever, uh, will map cleanly onto what you observe. You will be very, very anxious about things because that does not happen usually. Um, and yeah, um, besides uh, grand discourse on the intellectual preference um, traits, which are usually not that constructive, I'd um, yeah, sorry, I got lost because I did not. I had a speech. Can I? Can I? Let, let me just say yeah, one sure, thing sorry. before before we move off this point. Uh, a simple way that language might help is by invoking cognitive flexibility. So, um, oftentimes we think about the management of error being either updating predictions or acting on the world. Those are the that's the dyad usually. What it overlooks is the third one, which is we can also manage volatility by redeploying precision in a better way. So rather than just updating your model to fit the world or updating the world to fit your model, you can just change the set of what matters so that you're not, a, you're not really updating the model and you're not really changing the world. You're just changing the problem landscape. And that's something language allows us to do. It's maybe one of the, one of the really amazing things that language allows us to do is we can use language to bootstrap that kind of precision adjustment. So if the train doesn't come on time, we both notice it, okay, and we feel bad. That's perceptual updating. We might go and get a taxi. That's active updating. But I might just say to you, um, "Wow, look, isn't that isn't it lovely that now we get a little bit more time to read our book or to continue our conversation or let's finish our coffee with a little bit of ease." I mean, we get an extra twenty minutes now. Even just saying that redeploys precision over the problem space. Now the train being late isn't volatility in the system. The train being late is signaling to the system that a better than expected slope has been achieved. Isn't that so interesting? The exact same occurrence is either undigestible volatility, right? Like you're going to be late, oh my goodness, or it's an opportunity for an improvement in the system, which is now you get more time with the person that you're um, taking the train with. And that was just a matter of linguistic um, perturbance of the mm. way that precision is being deployed. So I, if you're looking at, if you wanted to dig into the research here, I would look up cognitive flexibility and language or coaching. Cognitive flexibility it, is such a good point here. If okay. I answer something, um, so the uh, you have a paper by Nick Clark on uh, the specific anchoring role of language, and something it entails is that basically you got like if the active inference picture is correct, you flexibly predict a flow in the uh, interoceptive, proprioceptive, uh, exteroceptive—is that even a thing? Uh, space. And that is that is what builds an integrated experience, integrated uh, you know um, cognition. And language it adds another layer of complexity. If you can just talk to yourself in your head, that is another dimension that you can predict and that can be coherent or incoherent with uh, your world. And so that is an extremely powerful anchoring system because I just have to like tell a plan to myself and boom that. Uh, pushes me, nudges me nicely toward the plan. But then you can have a uh, different level of meta expectation over how language corresponds to reality. And I'd say a very, very strong factor of you know, uh, aversion to uncertainty is whether you expect uh, your plans or your linguistic structure to nicely map onto reality because it, it will not happen. But if you expect strongly that it will be the case, you will have to make it happen somehow. And here you will uh, adapt rigid uh, strategies and you will like lose flexibility, but also language and sorry for flexibility to be the case in the first place. So it's about coupling between dimension uh, of cognition. Yeah, and I would just uh, just kind of this uh, risk and danger are uh, two things that I've been really interested in across a kind of variety of different contexts. And I, I would say some of the things that have been said, like the kind of how you can influence the system by externalizing things through language and the different strategies that systems whatever scale they're on have at minimizing prediction error um minimizing free energy but also i would just emphasize the importance of like external context here as well so even in the case of like a collective like a business you still have to take into account the environment in which the business is operating and i 
I've been really interested in a particularly extreme example of context. Um, I used to do, still do some work in philosophy of sport, and I've been really interested in dangerous sports and why there seems to be this insane contextual effect where within a very kind of narrow contextual band of sporting practice, people seem willing to take on risks that outside of that context would just be completely insane. Um, and I think this is something that's probably going to come up again, again, in, uh, uh, you know, subsequent weeks as well here, when we talk about, um, the way that expectations on an individual or a collective basis can be set, but through other minds, uh, so like patient. So what somebody else I expect myself to do and, and so on and so on. Uh, Darius, you've had your hand up a while. Do you want to jump in? Yes, please. I'm not sure this is the sort of grand synthesis of any of this, but um, flow was mentioned. As I said, it's a kind of um, pet topic of mine. And something that we know about flow, and, and this is why it's integrated into this idea of language and agency, is that at least in its original conception, success Mahali and the sort of qualitative experience associated with flow, you would find stuff like not only the dilation of time, but also the reduction in self-consciousness. And now this is sort of picking up a lot of work that happens at UCL and people like Jeremy Skipper, how integrated language is into the sense of self. And it seems to me, and I, you know, this is kind of shooting from the hip, that all of these very deep-rooted, I guess they're kind of psychotechnologies, the self language, seem to dissipate at this Goldilocks zone, at this point of, at, the, at this edge of criticality, at this flow state, which makes me think if the flow state is a phenomenological offshoot of being, you know, optimally reducing prediction error, what is the kind of role of the concept of the self or linguistic functions? Because it seems to me that that becomes a regulatory function when that optimality is reduced, when stuff starts going wrong. Um, so I think you can also think about this in the kind of Heideggerian or Dreyfus sense of just opening a door. You only start to represent the door in yourself. You only give it the linguistic object of a door when you can't open it. When you open a door, st standard, there is no representation going there. I mean, you could even argue there's no qualia there. So I'm wondering how deep that runs and what the kind of, what we can say about the role of agency, selfhood, maybe even consciousness, um, because they don't seem to be that prevalent, at least from my understanding, when we are at the edge of criticality. So is the, the suggestion you're making there is, um, it sounds like what you're saying that these, I think you call them psychotechnologies, which I really like, uh, you know, like language and, uh, and, and self mod, like certain aspects of self modeling, they are a kind of scaffolding, uh, or like a ladder that you then kind of gets kicked away once you reach a certain kind of edge of criticality, like where the performance becomes, I don't know what you kind of want to yeah. say there, but you're performing yeah. at such a level that you just don't need those, those scaffoldings. Yeah. Or, or the self regulatory mechanisms that we harness when we're not in flow are linguistic or agentic in essence and once yes once you sort of you, you don't need that when you're at the sort of yes when you're at this edge of criticality um and i, I you know i only postulate that because i want I, i'm only i'm only thinking how deep does that go because i know obviously the the active inference framework is trying to tackle in some ways the hard problem as well and there are some flotations of the idea at least within the flow community about the kind of i don't want to say elimination but the moderation the modulation of qualia under flow states so could that could we also consider that to be an a construct um which happens when we're not necessarily optimally you know producing prediction error yeah. so a couple of things i so i'm certainly not the person to start talking about consciousness so i won't um but i would just um i one of some of the readings that i mentioned in the lecture might be interesting for you on this topic so if we're talking about certain structures that seem very very pervasive in our phenomenology and how those structures can sometimes 
kind of dissolve away um, and how that might be accounted for under a active inference framework. There's some really interesting work on psychedelics by George Dean and some of George Dean's uh, co-conspirators. I know I know Mark and Sam Wilkinson worked on a paper with George. So George Dean's done some work on kind of ego dissolution and certain kinds of experiences um, related to selfhood. Um, kind of, and I, I kind of don't want to overstep the mark, I, but I think they kind of come. They fall generally under this kind of rebus model of um, psychedelic efficacy so I, d I don't know if people are familiar with this but this kind of finds a natural articulation through predictive processing and hierarchical self-modeling and and that kind of stuff i also wanted to really quickly flag on this topic i'll find the paper and i'll put it up on the coda because i don't think i'll be able to find it quickly enough now but there was a, a paper that came out very recently um that showed the efficacy of um internal self-talk on sports performance so there were so they did a they did an experiment with cyclists and they found that when you um when cyclists were allowed to engage in kind of constant self-talk with them so like an inner monologue in their head their uh, their performance at cycling was like measurably boosted which i thought was really interesting and kind of relevant here so but it's 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 interesting because it kind of just kind of uh it, it it sounds like it might prima facie be in tension with what we were saying about flow states as well right so it's if if the real edge of performance is is a place where these structures of phenomenology phenomenology bleed away um it kind of calls into question like to what extent are these psycho technologies effective and in what way are they effective and yeah there's a yeah just a whole kind of universe of really interesting questions there so if I may, uh, self-food indirectly will be the, the central topic of the last uh, two sessions. Uh, my position about it is that it's um, self-food in the sense we use all of the time uh, is a quite high level construct that uh, emerges from the ability we have to compare our activity to a socially embedded model of our activity. So that is something that is quite specific to humans because of their linguistic ability and or because of their tendency to, um, to what Tomasello calls a shared intentionality, so the ability to collectively define and make plans. Um, so basically, this is something that enables a very deep, very um, profound and robust transmis transmission of uh, cultural knowledge and transmission of norms. This is what enables the construction of norms. Uh, but it's quite heavy cognitively, uh, and it is predictable that if you're busy comparing what you do to what an idealized, idealized version of yourself is doing, you're gonna invest less cognitive energy in actually doing the thing that you would if you just, you know, did a thing. So I'd say you have a pretty direct entailment of uh, the uh, this flow thing uh, from this model. Yeah. Yes. This is my conclusion. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, I think so. We've run uh, almost thirty minutes over time, and I know uh, Mark's Mark's had to go, and I'm going to have to go. Very. I'm, I think I pretty much have to go. So, um, I just wondered if anybody has any final kind of quick questions or comments. Maybe we can move towards wrapping it up. Um, I'll, I'll I'll make a few comments, but Ben, you, you you're um, welcome to leave, and other people welcome to stay. Um if they would like so yeah thank you for I mean, yeah yeah well first um just on a on a on a logistical note there was a little bit of lag so i'll encourage everyone who's listening as well as who's participating that we eventually plan to as with all of our live streams develop a transcript which will be curated and published and eventually not so far away in the future that'll be enabled with speech modeling to generate podcast quality audio so the future will be smooth we promise um but a few really interesting pieces that i that i picked out while i was embodying and listening um so regina you you opened the discussion with the discuss with uh, surprise and creativity and Indeed, it sounds like it's going to be attention. How, how can a framework whose imperative is bounded surprise as opposed to, say, maximized reward? How can a framework whose imperative is surprise minimization and bounding be used to generate novelty? And I felt like people provided a lot of really 
cool answers. And one other thing it reminds me of is uh, Doug Hofstetter's notion of spectishness. I don't know how do you pronounce it, but S P H E X I S H N E S S, and it's the Spex wasp. And so he says, well, forget this whole creativity thing. Because when we talk about creativity, it's like some sort of, you know, pantheon, like divine status. And the muses have to be, uh, you know, called in. And so then, oh, that's not real creativity and this isn't real creativity. And so instead he says, well, let's just focus on what would be the opposite. And that would be the rote procedural following even when there's an opportunity for what we would call creativity. And then there's a continuum. So why does somebody paint that painting? Well, why didn't they invent a new genre? Well, why didn't they invent a new media? And so all activity is existing within this continuum of creativeness, which has many features such as generativity and productivity, but also novelty, but a bounded novelty. It's not creative to, to knock the chessboard pieces off in a way that there might be an elegant chess move who only somebody in a certain cognitive setting could detect the aesthetics of, but I think that that was awesome. Um, and then the second uh, piece that really was was powerful was what Mark uh, Mark's train. The I guess the trains don't run on time where Mark is, but but that's okay because he was able to rather than treat that as an undigestible surprise, that was able to be basically cognitively metabolized into like an opportunity for a friendship through language as a social medium. And then he connected that to, to cognitive flexibility and coaching. And then I thought about self-talk and our inner monologue, inner voice. And then Darius, that, that was very um, provocative that like we aren't having self-talk, potentially not even having a self in the flow manifold experience of the self or the, the speech self self-talk or again potentially even the total actual self as a technology and so then like healthy self-talk would guide us to the flow and be kind of like a self-limiting technology because it would be like used in order to not be needed to be used which is kind of how we would hope adaptive technologies would be versus a maladaptive technology would be something that um, entrenches its own utilization, potentially at the expense of the functionality, kind of like doom scrolling status, but that's internal rumination and those are the kinds of things that people have simulated in active inference. So those were some really cool pieces. That was a great discussion. Could I just, uh, just, just add something on the topic of creativity that I... Uh should have said earlier as well because i think it's really relevant to regina's question and just the topic of creative and novel behaviors in general under active inference i think that whenever we talk about especially artistic creativity there's a tendency even even for people who are kind of well very very well burrowed into active inference and and activism and and these kinds of frameworks from cognitive science i think there's a tendency to think of creativity as as still like it's almost like the last bastion of internal cognitivist thinking. Like you, you think creativity is something that happens in here and bursts outwards. And so how does that happen with this kind of whatever cognitive architecture we're positing? But there's really very cool work by, uh, I have to give a shout out to Mike Wheeler, um, who has written some papers on the extended mind and creativity and one thing that's not really come up very much that I didn't get time to talk about in the lecture is this really nice natural marriage between the extended mind and active inference, um, something that Andy Clark has been working on, and I know he's going to be doing a lot more work on it. But the claim Wheeler makes and some others, um, I think Joanna Zielinska has written, written a little bit about this as well, is the fact that creativity itself is just as subject to kind of uh material in but the the, the the sculpting effects of material environments and socio-cultural environments as everything else is so create creativity is not this kind of romantic with a capital r kind of internal process that kind of bursts forth but it's creative thinking is just as much extended and embedded as everything else and there's some really great examples in 
in Mike Wheeler's essay. Um, I don't know, is anybody familiar with the band Alt J? They're a British band. They were kind of really big a few years ago. They won the Mercury Music Award because they have a super original sound. So Alt J have this really quiet, tinkling. Uh, yeah, they are a great band. They're one of my favorites. And they, they, they have this really quiet, tinky sound that everybody kind of assumed was just the result of some kind of internal genius on the part of the band. And as it turns out, Alt J originally they they tried to rehearse as a as an indie rock band, but they were confined to rehearsing in an apartment block and they kept getting noise complaints. And so they ended up developing this quiet, tinkly sound because it was the only sounds they could rehearse that wouldn't get them kicked out of their apartment. And I think this is a really beautiful example of how like even the most creative processes that seem on the face of it really creative are in fact just a subject to these external kind of this kind of agent environment system that underpins the whole framework so it's that's something that's going to apply to absolutely everything awesome and just a last question people are welcome to 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 drop off um the next section that we're heading into i'll be doing the lecture that's going to be in august and it's going to be on collective behavior so what would people like to learn or focus on about collective behavior anyone who hasn't um spoken or or it can just be a thought question but i haven't prepared the slides at all so i'm happy to take suggestions Yeah, Darius, or then anyone else? I think what might be interesting is if we're saying that these uh, systems are all in the business of producing prediction error of self-evidencing, why do we see a diversity of, of um, why, why do we see a diversity of social cultures, of norms, of um, standards at a global scale? Why do we not just see some um, Hom homogenous way to re reduce friction error, which would manifest as a kind of singular culture, which which is in the kind of business of self evidencing. That just kind of popped to my mind. Cool. Anyone else want to give give a thought on collective behavior or on any other aspect? Otherwise, it's been great. I would like to make a comment of uh, creativity. So, but uh, does anyone like it's the moment if you want to make a comment on the next session? I don't want to cut that. Okay. Go for it. Uh, so, uh, I'd say that um, to complement what uh, Ben said, that creativity is something that is intrinsically very hard to model because, uh, by definition, uh, creativity is something that brings about something new, let us say. And uh, the mathematics we have to describe physics and life, they're not very good at new things uh, because the most basic tool you have, the basic way to represent a system that literally everyone uses is a state space, which is uh, the list of all possibilities of the system. If you say something is creative, you're likely to think that it means it can bring about new possibilities. And this intuition, it conflicts directly with the very basic use of math to describe it. So it is basically the same issues I was uh, referring to earlier when I uh, talked about the comparison between active inference and uh, an activist, uh, so let's say, uh, activity biology inspired model of uh, cognition. And a core concept historically in those circles is uh, autopoiesis. So the ability of the living to uh, self-create. Literally, this is Greek for self-creation. And you had uh, a lot of drift and conceptualization and uh, ambiguities that were resolved or not resolved and led to the crisis of framework, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but today we talk of autonomy rather than autopoiesis. And we define autonomy as uh, the property for a system of constraints over the activity of a system uh, to reproduce themselves. And because we're talking uh, constraints, 
just the ability to influence causality outcomes. There is no really a prior that dynamics in this space would be conservative. So we have a possibility for constraints to, you know, bring about new things and uh, reconfigure themselves. And the notion of agency ad use is based on that. It's the ability to, uh, let's say, reconfigure constraints in your environment. And so is uh, the notion of creativity, which would be a likely a very close proxy to that. But it's something that we do not know how to prevent. And most of the mathematics that exist are structurally enabled to represent. And so, yeah, that's a big one. So true. Michael? Uh, I, uh, good to be here. Sorry, I was late. Uh, uh, what comes to mind for me at the collective, you know, I mentioned units of collective life. What is it a we? Is it a we a pair? And uh, you know what? You know what? What are the what are the units of we? And any thoughts or insights about that? Uh, the the stages of the emergence of formation into a collective, um, from a me to a we, for example. Or um, um, oh my God, I had a, a one that was on the tip of my tongue, and it just escaped me. Oh, um, you know this idea of precision that um, that. I think it was Mark Miller was talking about or Matt uh, saying, um, you know, uh, at the uh, 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 if there's options in the channel, looking at collectives and what might be some of the most well understood limiting beliefs about when we use language of collective that keeps us repeating the same blind spots um, uh, and how might we think differently about collective so that we we escape those predispositions if you will make sense i'll do what i can do in the solo <laughs> lecture and I'll, I'll look forward to, to the conversation where we can unpack it yeah. Exciting. Thank you for doing it. I'm looking, looking forward to it. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, Nathan or David, you want to add anything? All right. Then thank you all. Hope everyone is um, enjoying the course so far. Thanks, Aval, again for, for coordinating it and to, to Ben for this great section. Now you can put on your student hat again. So. And to you for organizing. Thank you. See you all next time. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Um, thanks. Thanks, everyone.